We're here in the National Herbarium and I'm Colin Kelleher, the keeper of the National Herbarium. You might wonder what exactly is a herbarium and really they're just collections or stores of plant, uh, dead plant specimens, so dried and pickled. There's about 3,000 uh, herbaria across the world and they together they store over 390 million specimens. The National Herbarium here in Glasnevin is relatively small. We contain about 600,000 specimens. Uh, although it's small, internationally we're the largest and most comprehensive uh, herbarium, hence we're called the National Herbarium. And in a way, uh, with that 600,000 specimens, we're actually the most biodiverse area in Ireland in terms of plant diversity. Uh, we have 400 species per square metre on average. However, these plants are all dead, as I said, they're dried and they're pickled. So what use are 600,000 specimens and indeed 390 million worldwide? Well, there's a huge amount of use uh, that you can put a herbarium specimen to. One of the most obvious is we have on the label, we have when it was taken and where it was taken and then by who and then what it actually is. But the when and the where are absolutely key. They tell us where a plant was and when it was, um, when it occurred. So we can build up an understanding of where all the plants are in Ireland or indeed worldwide, and we can then use that data to assess changes over time. Uh, we can then go into even more detail by looking at the structures of the plants to see how they interact with the environment. And then we can go a step further and we can actually extract DNA from the plant material and look at genetic changes over time or just genetic differences between species. One particular use that herbarium specimens are put to is naming plants. So uh, if you go to your local, um, local woodland, local grassland, you're identifying plants and you're looking at a guidebook, the names in those guidebooks will link back to what's called a type specimen. It's a little sort of complicated but in essence uh, it's just a fancy specimen and they they come in these pink or these red folders and the red folders are deliberate to make them stand out and really what they are are the first specimen that was named okay so when you uh, think of those names that you have from your your guidebook each of those names will go back to we, we would call them standard bearers so these are the original specimen that that name derived from. So it's like the biological equivalent to a meter stick or a, a kilogram. You know, that's the standard for measurement and these are the standards for the names. And the cool thing about uh, a herbarium is that you can compare all these specimens. So if I go out and I say, I've found a new species, then people will want to know, well, what have you compared it to? I can't just name something randomly. I have to compare it to closely related species and even closely related genera. And so that's where a herbarium really comes in. You can then, as you see here, we have all these specimens laid out. These are all from the genus uh, Ranunculus, which are our buttercups. And so we have the terrestrial buttercups over here and the aquatic buttercups over here. And we can easily then take these specimens and compare them side by side. It's much more difficult to do that in the field when, you're, when everything is seasonal and you're dependent on not only weather conditions but season uh, and things in flower and fruit. But when they're captured in a herbarium specimen, that is a physical snapshot of a particular time, a particular place. And we can then use that to assess variation over time and then uh, improve classification of plants. In terms of sustainability, uh, one of the major threats uh, for biodiversity would be invasive species. So these are species that are introduced accidentally or even deliberately, and then they take over the niche of a native species or a native suite of species. And the herbarium records are really instrumental in us combating invasive species. They can tell us where the species first occurred in, in Ireland, for example, and then how it's moving across uh, the island. We can have like a thousand bramble specimens. What use is a thousand bramble specimens? Well, 
they have uh, all the data associated with them in terms of where they were collected and when they were collected. And we can use that and then use the physical specimen to assess their interaction with their environment. One classic example is looking at uh, phenology. Phenology is the, the timing of biological events, so we can look at, say, flowering and fruiting. The bramble specimens were used for that, and they were used to show that, in fact, flowering has come uh, about a week earlier in the past 70 years. That's the herbarium specimens showing us how plants are interacting and basically giving us evidence for climate change. So what we're looking at here are uh, specimens of CP and it's uh, Lathyrus japonicus. This is a, quite a rare plant in Ireland and it forms these ephemeral populations on the coast. Uh, they pop up and some survive just a few years or even one season and then disappear. But again the cool thing about a herbarium specimen is that we can have a herbarium specimen of a population that no longer exists. So we have populations in Donegal, and in various places in Cork and Kerry that no longer exist today. And one of the things we did with these specimens is we extracted DNA out of the specimens. So these are plants that no longer exist, but we're interested in what was the genetic diversity over time and has it changed over time compared to what it is today. And we can only do that because we have the physical specimens from the past and we're able to extract the DNA out of them and analyze them. And this, the information from that genetic uh, analysis then can feed into uh, conservation measures in order to uh, sustainably conserve this population into the future. And here we are in the laboratory. This is where we do the genetic analysis. And I'm going to let uh, Sam talk about uh, all the genetic analysis and the process of doing that. Hello, my name is Sam Belton and I'm a postdoctoral researcher based here in the lab in, in the herbarium. Um, so I'm currently working on a, a two-year project which is funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Uh, and basically what I'm doing uh, when I'm not in the lab is I'm out traveling around the country to different forest locations uh, and sampling our native tree species. So what we have here uh, are a number of different bags and each bag contains leaves. And so each bag here would have come from a different forest uh, location somewhere in Ireland. Each bag here contains uh, silica gel and the purpose of the silica gel is to preserve the leaves once they've been removed from the trees. Within each bag, there are sample envelopes uh, containing a few leaves, and each envelope comes from an individual tree. On the envelope, we have written the, the date uh, and a few other bits of information, but importantly, we have written down the GPS coordinates for the individual tree. So we can always go back to the forest if you want to go back and examine or re-extract or take material from uh, a, a tree that's particularly interesting. As Colin would have explained earlier, we're not only analysing DNA from samples going back hundreds of years, we're also an analysing samples from DNA that we collect today in the field. One of the things that we do when we extract our DNA is we use the PCR technique. So PCR is the technique which is used to test for the presence of COVID-19 in saliva samples. And so what we can see here are the results of PCR reactions from two separate birch trees uh, and these are trees which would have looked identical to physically examine the leaves but when we look at the genetic level we can see that they are in fact two separate individuals. So far we've sampled nearly 2,000 trees from native woodland sites all across the country. When we've finished our DNA analysis and we've got an idea of the levels of genetic variation in our native woodland sites We'll be able to use that information to sustainably manage our forests into the future, which is going to be especially important um, when we consider climate change. Hi, my name is uh, Daryl Lupton and I'm, um, I am the curator here at the National Botanic Gardens of Ireland. Um, I've just taken up this role in February of this year um, after finishing a, a 10 year period in the Sultanate of Oman in Arabia, where I was head of the Botany and Conservation Department there at the newly formed botanic gardens. So as curator here at the gardens, I, I'm responsible for the living collections, 
of which we have in and around 15,000 registered, uh, documented, named and labelled plants within the collections. And that's what's a, that, that element about plants being labelled is one of the key um, elements uh, and characteristics of a botanic garden. Our collections are not just plants uh, and trees and shrubs and so on. Our collections are all data-based. Everything is labelled, including uh, information on where the plant has been collected from, including the plant family, including the plant's full name or cultivar name, if it's appropriate. So on, on top of the, the research work here and the conservation work that goes on in the gardens, uh, probably our most important uh, element is as a visitor facility. We, we have our plant collections are, are stunningly beautiful. We have collections from all over the world housed in this 50 acre site. So the visitor here can see plants from the tropics, from the Mediterranean, from alpine areas of the world, all within one area. And this is a very, very unique uh, experience for most people. We're very conscious of providing all the various uh, seasonal changes uh, for visitors. So in the summertime, when you visit the garden, you will see fantastic, really bright, colorful floral displays. And in the autumn, as the, as the plants die back and the leaves fall, you will be wowed by the, by the wonderful autumn color in the arboretum and, and across the trees and larger shrubs in the garden. Visitors are also encouraged to, to come back and to engage with the um, education staff here, whose role is to impart the importance of the Botanic Garden and the role of the Botanic Garden as an international uh, botanical institution. So visitors can not only take strolls in the gardens and enjoy the space and the collections, they can also get further and deeper involved in the history of the gardens. So the tours can show you elements of the history, they can show you elements of the important plant collections, that is plants that may be extremely rare around the world or plants that were collected by very important botanists over the last several hundred years. Um, to traditional plant uses. So tours are varied um, and they prove very, very popular with the public. So part of my role is to liaise with the education team uh, to ensure that visitors, when they're coming to the gardens, are being given the most uh, up-to-date information uh, and that the collections are being used to their fullest potential in terms of education and so on. Of course, one of, the, one of the key elements at the garden here uh, and, and in the world in general is the, the idea of sustainability and that sustainable use of resources and where plants play a role in that. Uh, many of the products we use uh, in our daily lives are plant derived. So it's very, very important that we consider plants uh, as being uh, an integral part of a sustainable future. Uh, at the gardens, for example, in terms of planting, we're, we're conscious of climate change, climate change predictions would, would indicate that we're going to get uh, drier summers, maybe increased rainfall or storminess, stormy periods. So we, we have to start considering our collections and how appropriate our collections are for the future. We certainly don't want to be growing uh, trees that require huge amounts of water during the summer. We can see from the last few years, we've had very, very dry periods. We want to move away from trees that are water hungry so we, we can reduce our water uh, output um, so with the selections of our trees and plantings going forward, we will be considering very carefully where they come from. So selecting trees, for example, from drier parts of the world which are more evolved uh, for dealing with drier drought periods is something we need to consider. Also the use of energy in our buildings. Um, we are very conscious of, of the collections. Many of our collections are tropical or subtropical and they require heat during the winter and sometimes even during the summer. So we're, we're conscious about adapting our collections um, going forward that they don't require so much heat during the colder winter months. This is something that we see as, as slightly unsustainable. Um, so we're very conscious of, of, of doing that. Also our use of pesticide. We have reduced the use of pesticide here enormously over the last 10 to 15 years or so, uh, where it was very commonplace in the past to just spray weed killer. We no longer do that. A lot of um, our control is done now mechanically. Uh, or we're using products that are environmentally safe. So all of these changes are happening now and will continue to happen in the future. Uh, and this is something that is driving uh, uh, the garden's ethos. So since the garden was opened in 1795, it's had a long uh, association with training and education. And from the very early days of the garden where, where staff were trained and students were trained in agriculture, um, right up to the modern day when we have a whole range of horticultural courses here run by Chagosk, and the relationship we've had with Chagas has gone back many, many decades. And some of Ireland's best gardeners have come through the gardens here uh, under the Chagas program. 
We also have programmes here of staff training, our own in-house continual professional development where staff have had the opportunities over the years to go and exchange programmes to other international gardens to look at how practices are done in, for example, the UK, the United States, Australia uh, and the tropics. So the National Botanic Gardens Glass Nevin and its sister garden Kilmacurra down in County Wicklow are part of a much bigger international global partnership of botanic gardens. But Glass Nevin sits within this programme and th this programme is, is very, very beneficial for many reasons. One, we share information very easily with, with each other. We often share plant material. So plants that are very, very rare in the wild can be grown in one garden, but also can be distributed to other gardens. This is a, an excellent way of safe, safe keeping these plants that are um, largely threatened in the wild. We also have a, a very, very successful seed exchange program with many gardens around the world, particularly strong ties with European gardens in that sense. So our staff here will regularly collect seed, particularly in the autumn, make full lists of our seeds that are available. And these botanic gardens from around the world can contact us and we will send them that seed. And likewise, we will also look at other gardens uh, internationally. We'll say, we are very interested in growing this species. If you have seed or vegetative cutting material, could you please send it on to us? And generally this works very well. And we are allowed to develop our collections, broaden the diversity of our collections through exchanging seed and cutting material from gardens around the world. Also, we are very much involved in the development of conservation uh, policies in terms of um, plant conservation programs internationally. Botanic gardens form a very, very important part of that program for plant conservation globally. Uh, and the botanic gardens here at Glass Nevin has not only fed into the National Biodiversity Plan for Ireland, but has also fed into similar programs around the world and continues to do so. Many of our staff here are very active in, in these areas. So I mentioned uh, earlier about uh, rare and uh, threatened plants, enigmatic plants. Well, I, I don't think there's anything any more enigmatic or emblematic plant than this one I'm standing beside here. This is a, a cycad, Encephalartus woodii. And this plant was first discovered in the late, in the late 1890s in KwaZulu-Natal in Durban in South Africa. The plant only came from a number of individuals. And this plant was donated to Glass Nevin Botanic Gardens in 1905. And the plant has moved around uh, from the Great Palm House here in the gardens to the curvilinear range next door and back again. Uh, but it's been sitting here for 116 years. And this year, for the first time, it has produced four cones. And what makes this very, very exciting is that this plant is extremely rare, effectively extinct in the wild. So plants exist only in botanic gardens. So far, only male cones have been produced globally in the botanic garden collections where it exists. And unfortunately, though it did cone this year, what we're looking at here are male cones. So although uh, Encephalartus woodii at the National Botanic Gardens turns out after 116 years to reveal itself as a male, all is not lost. What we, what we will do here is we will take a section or we will take a whole cone, one of the four, um, when it's matured, and we will preserve that in the, in the scientific collection here. One for our own records and second for maybe public engagement and so on. The other thing we can do is we can collect pollen once pollen is produced from the plant and we can store that pollen and freeze it and keep it uh, active and viable for a very very long time. So if a female plant ever did turn up uh, in the wild or in another botanic garden we would have viable pollen in which we could donate and try to cross fertilize and produce seed. This would be really a, a, an incredible uh, feat from botanic gardens and, and this represents really uh, what, what botanic gardens do. We are at the essence of conservation. We conserve very, very rare species, and several artists would I being possibly the rarest of them all. We've made incredible advances in science and the way we're able to produce food. Here we are in Chagask Ashtown in our glass house facility, essentially our outdoor growing lab. We're able to manipulate and control the indoor environmental conditions using screening, using heating, and that means we can grow crops all year round. There is a whole host of exciting research going on at the moment. My role focuses on sustainable horticulture, and this extends to thinking about how we can use resources more efficiently, how we can use ecosystem goods and services in the way we produce food, and how we can reduce waste and loss in the system. 
One of the projects I work on is helping growers move towards more sustainable forms of packaging. We're helping growers, like tomato growers, move away from using traditional plastics to the use of starch-based plastics which are more environmentally sustainable. We've made incredible strides in growing food, driven by advances in science. The process of automation, sensing technology, digitization and soilless growing media means we can grow crops year-round, indoors and even in urban environments. We have a lot of physical infrastructure to help us carry out our research, like research labs, glass houses, orchards and land to produce the crops. What we have here is the first of its kind in Ireland, a 12.2 metre insect suction trap, passively capturing insects while they fly. Many insects, like aphids, are pests to our crops. We can test the insects for the presence of virus and bacteria. We can then inform farmers about the presence of these insects which transmit many viruses to their crops and affect yield. Growers are already finding ways to reduce fertilizer and pesticide inputs, and they're finding ways to switch to the use of biological-based products. Waste streams are being recycled more efficiently, and we're getting particularly good at this. Although sometimes these changes are costly for growers to make, we're seeing more and more growers adopting these sustainable practices. Sustainability is pervasive, and really everything we do now is contributing to this goal. This year, Chagas launched its sustainability strategy. There is also a weekly seminar series called the Signpost series, and this disseminates research from within Chagas and across Ireland. The Chagas website is an excellent source of information, and two things may be particularly interesting to people watching. Tea Research is our magazine published quarterly. It presents the latest research for a non-scientific audience. We also have Chagask's Walsh Scholarship Programme, which supports researchers to carry out graduate degrees. With the increase in digitization and automation, increasingly non-traditional routes like computer science and engineering are also offering pathways into horticulture.